the one you had in your pocket. All right, ooh, that's been loud. Good evening and welcome to our 2014, uh, 2017, June 14th work session on charter government. Um, I wanna welcome you all here. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, before we get started, I would like to start with introductions. We're gonna start at the very end of the table down there. Please state your name and what organization you represent. Dan, we're gonna start with you. And you all will have to pass the microphone and please lean directly into it. Make sure that we get you on record. Is Thank this you. close enough? That is close enough. Thank you. Dan Wilson, Manti Clerk's Office. Neil Unruh, Comptroller, Manti Sheriff's Office. Rick Wells, Manti County Sheriff's Office. Gene Palin, Holmes Beach City Commission. Charlie Hackney, Manti County Property Appraiser. Brian Williams, Vice Mayor, City of Palmetto. John Chappie, Vice Mayor, City of Bradenton Beach. Ginger Delegal, Executive Director of Florida Association of Counties. Mickey Palmer, County Attorney, Manatee County Government. Bill Clegg, Assistant County Attorney. Alexandria Nicodemi, Assistant County Attorney. Robin DeSabatino, Manatee County Commissioner. Priscilla Trace, Manatee County Commissioner. Betsy Benack, Manatee County Commissioner, Chair of the Commission. Steve Johnson, Manatee County Commissioner. Vanessa Baugh, Manatee County Commissioner. Charles Smith, Manatee County Commissioner. Carol Whitmore, Manatee County Commissioner. Ron Serrano, Deputy Superintendent, Manatee School District. Lee Whitehurst, East Manatee Fire Rescue District Chief. John O'Leary, East Manatee Fire District. Richard Jacobs. Gary Lawson, East Manatee Fire Rescue. Robin Conley, East Manatee Fire Commissioner. Uh, Randy Cooper, West Manatee Fire Rescue. Okay, again, welcome. Thank you everyone for being here. And I apologize to the audience, um, citizens, that we have to have our backs to you. Unfortunately, with this big of a crowd, we have to set the tables up and we're going to have a presentation by the Florida Association of Counties, so it's very important that we're all able to see this. Um, if anyone else is here representing the cities, you can come forward and we'll introduce you um, when you get here. Um, here, here. Sharon of Brayden Beach is here. Welcome. Okay. Carol, if you'd like to come sit at the table, anyone that is representing a city is welcome to come to the table or not if you don't want to. Nope. Okay, all right. Again, today's um, work session is an opportunity for us to um, hear about what charter government is and isn't. It is a work session to uh, get our questions answered, to share information. Um, we're really happy that our uh, county attorney agreed to take this on to bring us this information. And I'm gonna turn it over to him at this point uh, Mickey Palmer will tell us what our agenda is and what we're gonna, who we're going to hear from. Mickey. Thank you, Madam Chair, elected officials. Good evening. Uh, for those folks who did not pick up a copy of this evening's PowerPoint as you came in, I believe that there are plenty of copies back there for those that don't have a copy and would like to get one. Um, this is actually not my show tonight. It's the show of the person that I'm about to introduce. Uh, it is with great pleasure uh, that we were able to land uh, the Executive Director of the Florida Association of Counties to come visit us here in our lovely county uh, this evening. Uh, Ginger Delegal, to my immediate right, uh, will be the main presenter here uh, this evening. Uh, I just, just learned a few minutes ago that Ginger was the recipient of the Ralph Mars Marsicano Award uh, for 2017, which is the highest and most prestigious award that can be given to a local, local government law attorney. And uh, she has recently uh, been promoted to the executive director of position of Florida Association of Counties. And so again, it is with great pleasure uh, that I introduce to you Ginger Delegal. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Madam 
Madam Chair, good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Palmer. Um, now I have to tell you, like I would tell anybody else with that kind of an introduction and letting you know that I have been the recipient of award, is that I raised three teenage daughters with my husband. Um, they are currently 19, 17, and 14. So according to them, I can now just sit down because there's nothing else that I can tell you tonight that makes absolutely any sense because I know nothing. So um, no, it is with great pleasure that my husband and I have had the opportunity opportunity to raise our daughters here in Florida. Um, I am a big believer when I do am able to provide presentations for community groups that you all know who you're talking to. So I do have a series of disclaimers. Um, they go something like the following. I have been in Florida now for 24 years. I was born and raised in Georgia. I think that's important for you to know that I am not a native Floridian by way of birth. Um, I did marry a, I have no idea how many generation um, Floridian. I have sent more of my money to the University of Florida by way of him as well. My household is a Florida Gator household. So for those of you who are Seminoles or Hurricanes, I apologize. I just put that out there. Bias, that's the way that goes. I am a Florida Gator. Um, the other thing that I do want to let you know is that I have been practicing in this area of the law for those 24 years that I have been here in Florida. And I know a fair amount about the Florida Constitution when it comes to local governments, but just as I t share you the st with you the story of my three teenage daughters, I don't know everything. And if you all have questions of me this evening that I do not know the answer to, I will tell you that I don't know the answer to that question. I am then more than happy, however, to share my business card with you and help you along with me find out what the answer is. So I just want to tell you that, that um, I know a fair amount in this area, but I don't know it all. And I'm gonna tell you if I don't know the answer to your question. All right, so with that, we're going to get started. Um, I am also a closet nerd. My children would tell you that it's not so much in the closet, I'm just a nerd. So this quote from Alex de Tocqueville sits right by that old black box on my desk, which is now called a landline telephone, you know, the one that nobody uses. But above that telephone um, is this quote from Alex de Tocqueville, who those of you who may know, he was a French political philosopher who traveled in the new American Republic in the first half of the 1800s and wrote his observations about this new republic how things were going here in the United States of America. And here's what he said about the issue that we're going to talk about this evening. The strength of free peoples resides in the local community. Local institutions are to liberty what primary schools are to science. They put it within the people's reach. They teach people to appreciate its peaceful enjoyment and accustom them to make use of it. Without local institutions, a nation may give itself a free government, but it has not got a spirit of liberty. And so I share this quote with you because this is the last disclaimer and then we'll get into the meat of what we're here to talk about this evening. And the last disclaimer is this, that I am a card carrying member of the club of home rule. That does not mean charter government only for counties. It means home rule. And we will talk about that and talk about what powers actually as a non-charter county in the area of home rule actually exist in Florida because they do exist. That is one of the myths that is very rampant in the state. It is somewhat understandable, but non-charter counties also have home rule powers, and we'll talk about where that comes from. So I am a strong proponent of home rule. I believe in that for this state, the, the uh, size that this state is now is the third largest state in the country. As of the last census, over two thirds of our citizens were born somewhere else, just like me. So to have two thirds of the third largest state in the country come from somewhere else, there's a lot of diversity. There are a lot of ideas about how we might accomplish things. One last little fact is that we are still in this state at a percentage of individuals who live in the unincorporated areas of a county at 49.9%. So there are 411 municipalities in this state and only half 
of our citizens live inside a municipality. What does that mean for us in the third largest state in the country, where two thirds of our citizens have come from somewhere else? Many of them are used to town style governments or what I would call traditional county governments, but very strong municipal governments. And those folks, so half of our state, are really looking to their county governments to provide those services at a municipal level that they were used to receiving in other states. So we have very much of a hybrid here in Florida of counties taking on some of the personality traits of municipalities where you might see that in other parts of the country. All right. So what is the Florida Association of Counties? We are a private voluntary association. We are a not-for-profit corporation. We currently have all 67 counties in the state of Florida as members. We don't have any regulatory authority over county commissioners, over county administrators, over county attorneys. Uh, we do not have any ethical code violation <laughs> enforcement powers over any of those folks. Um, I field a lot of phone calls from citizens who want to file a complaint with the Florida Association of Counties about a county employee or a county official, but that is not what we do. And so what do we do? Well, this is our core mission. The Florida Association of Counties helps counties effectively serve and represent Floridians by strengthening and preserving county home rule. It's a good thing I work there, huh? <laughs> it's actually a part of the mission statement through advocacy, education, and collaboration. And it is in that mission tonight that I have the great pleasure of being with you all in the mission of bringing forward some education for Manatee County as a community to have a common conversation with a common vocabulary and a common language about what charter government looks like in Florida. All right, so getting into the meat of it. I call this the what fors. So the topics that we're gonna talk about this evening are what is a charter county? What are the differences between a charter and a non-charter county? What can be included in a charter? And what are the steps to become and then to change a charter in a charter county? So we'll start with the basics. What is a county? How is a county different than a city or a municipality? What forms of county government are offered to Floridians by operation of state law? Who are the other county officers and what do they do? And are charter counties really different? So these are the questions that we'll talk about under this first topic of what is a county. So in Florida, the first two counties that were created literally just divided the state in two. One was Escambia and one was St. John's. Those were created back in 1821. They really didn't have any power. It literally was just a dividing line in the state of Florida to create those two particular counties. But this provisional government established a couple of things. It established a county judicial system, appointed county judges, clerks, and sheriffs and the county government was administered through the court system by five justices of the peace. Now, for those of you who may have lived in other counties in the state of Florida, this should look pretty darn familiar because for the vast majority of the counties in Florida, this is almost exactly what still exists today, meaning these other constitutional officers in addition to what we now would call the Board of County Commissioners, which is a five-member board. I know Manatee is seven. That is actually a choice that you still have in Florida as, an, as a non-charter county. You can make that decision, but the majority of them still have these five folks who function at the board level to provide county government. And so since 1821, we really haven't come a whole long way in terms of what the very basic form of county government looks like in Florida. So what is a county? Disclaimer, these are not technical definitions, okay? These are layman's definitions that um, I have developed so that we can have a conversation to really talk about and point out the differences between counties, between municipalities, and between special districts. So historically, counties and elsewhere in the country, because the strength of home rule for counties in Florida is not appreciated in all of the states of our country. But in those other places, a county is a political subdivision of the state established by the state to execute state services and functions at the local level. Well, what? 
here's what this means, is that originally in Florida, a county was created by the state government, so a top-down structure. It's still done that way, but it is a top-down structure with lines drawn on a map so that they could divide the state of Florida and primarily deliver state services under state direction and carry out state duty and functions. It was not localized in nature except to provide a local place where those services and duties were carried out. Let me give you an example. If you come to Tallahassee, those of you who have, the, have had the opportunity to visit the state capitol, if you have been inside any of the agency buildings, if you go inside the Department of Health, for example, expecting to get a flu shot, it doesn't happen there in Tallahassee at the Department of Health. Where does it happen? It happens at the local level. If you go inside the Department of Juvenile Justice, will you find services being directly provided to Florida's children? No. Where does that take place? At the local level. So this is very much still a feature of county government in Florida, even post home rule, meaning we are created by the state still to provide certain state services, but there's an extra piece that we'll spend most of this evening actually talking about, which is the home rule piece. But it is a top-down structure, involuntary in nature. You contrast that with a municipality. And a municipality is a local government that serves its citizens who created it by charter. This language is language of a voluntary nature. Under state law, the way, this is oversimplification, but the way that municipalities are formed is from the ground up, not from the state government down. It is groups of citizens getting together writing a charter, often for specific purposes. Um, there were times, certainly in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, where we were seeing groups of citizens who wanted additional police services. They may want a heightened level of EMS services, and they were getting together, creating their own government, very democratic process, it does go through the state legislature ultimately, but it started at the ground up and all in a very voluntary way, whereas counties are still top down and involuntary. Both of those, obviously counties and cities, provide what I would call general governmental services, so they are not just specific in nature, which is exactly what special districts do. Um, you've got obviously several chiefs here this evening from your special districts providing fire and EMS rescue services to you all here in Manatee County. It's a single purpose local government is the way the courts would describe it, meaning they have a single mission. It's to provide fire or to provide fire and rescue services. You see this in water control, flood control, mosquito control, and even school districts. Very single focus in terms of the governmental services that are provided. Obviously, that's not the case with a city and a county. And then a special district is also, in terms of creation and formation, it is a local government for this single purpose, but it is created by another level of government. So often it is a district that is created by a county, or it may be a special district that is created by a municipality. They do often come through the legislature, but again, very localized in nature and single purpose in nature. All right, so what do counties do? Well, traditionally, they only did state-mandated duties. So only those things that the state of Florida, through the Florida legislature, said that counties should be doing. They assessed property, kept the official records of the county area, they maintained the rural roads, so outside the municipalities, they administered the elections and performed judicial functions. Now obviously all of these duties and functions are still things that our county governments, whether they are charter or non-charter, in the state of Florida still provide. So these are still duties that get carried out at the county level. Some of them by constitutional officers, others through the board of county commissioners. But today, because of the demographics 
that we talked about at the very beginning of this large state, this very diverse state, and the number of individuals in Florida that live in the unincorporated areas of the state, we have an expansion and an, I would actually call it an explosion in the last 30 years of the services that counties are providing that again, folks in other parts of the country would really think of as municipal services. Public health and welfare, ambulance services, workforce development, affordable housing, parks and recreation, libraries, consumer protection, economic development, growth management, employment and training, the list really goes on and on and on. Um, and so there's a lot, and there is a lot of demand that is placed on county governments to serve its citizens in the way that the citizens would like to be served and to be governed. So the point of that is there are state mandated duties still at the local level and at the county level that have to be carried out. And then there are some services that counties then provide because the citizens have asked them to do it that expand into, in historical terms, what would be non-traditional areas. So the county functions under state law obviously come from state law. And where we find these provisions um, are in the Florida Constitution, which yes, as a nerd, I actually carry around with me. Um, two big provisions there in the Constitution that deal with finance and tax matters and then that deal with the home rule provisions. There are certain statutory sections also that govern the execution of the state mandated duties and then also authorize counties at a discretionary level to provide these additional services. And then there are other provisions of the state law that create actually shared programs between the state and county governments. So things like counties make a very significant contribution to the state of Florida so that Florida can pay the federal government our bill for Medicaid services, for example, here in the state. And there's other program sharing in the area of juvenile justice, in the areas of court funding. So those are really the big three, Medicaid, court funding, and juvenile justice that we share with the state that there are actually provisions in the Florida statutes that are governed. So one of the things folks generally ask a governmental entity, anytime a governmental entity is talking about an initiative, whatever it is, whether it is you know, backdoor um, solid waste collection services or whether it is actually imposing um, or raising an impact fee on new construction for parks. The question is, where do you have the authority to do that? Um, and where our authority comes from in the state of Florida is in these places, primarily from the Florida Constitution, from the Florida statutes in the form of general laws, and the laws of Florida, which are special acts. Those are bills that are passed by the legislature but only apply to a specific geographic area. So it would just apply to Manatee County or it might only apply to the city of Palmetto. They are very narrow in their focus. The Florida case law in Florida is extraordinarily um, constructive in terms of what authority has been given county government. And then when we get to the local level, County charters provide authority. They can also provide limitations, which we will talk about in a second, and then county ordinances and county resolutions. So these are really where the black and white letter of the law comes from when we're dealing with county authority. All right, so we've covered um, a couple of different things. We've covered what a county is, the sort of involuntary top-down type of structure, at least historically in the state of Florida. We have talked about how that differs from a municipality, um, which again historically was more from the bottom up and voluntary in nature, and then contrasted with a special district, which is generally geographic narrow in scope and then narrow in what its purpose is. Um, but we now also know that county government in the state of Florida, unlike other parts of the country, provide an entire um, spectrum of services that normally you wouldn't provide in other areas. So how do they do this? Well, this is where the form of county government comes from. Um, and we're continuing to lay our predicate to when we get to charters. Um, it's important to understand where all of that comes from so that you can see what the distinctions are when we get to charters. So there's three forms of county government in Florida. There's the county commission form, the commission county administrator form, and the commission elected chairman or the executive form. 
So the commission form of government is really where we started way back in the 1820s and 1840s in Florida. It has um, two features, basically. It's often where you find the county commission sitting very similarly on an organizational chart, which we'll look at in just a second, along with the constitutional officers, but not a lot of people who actually report to them at that level. The Board of County Commissioners in the commission form of government is carrying out both legislative functions as well as the executive functions. So they're setting policy and providing direction and then they are actually carrying it out as well. Um, we have about 10 counties in the state of Florida that still operate in this particular fashion. There is no county administrator when or county coordinator or county manager or whatever label or title that you want to give to that professional administrative position it just doesn't exist in these 10 counties in the state of florida obviously manatee is not one of them um, but just to show you a picture of what it looks like is here on the organizational chart and so you basically have these state mandated duties and functions being carried out obviously by the constitutional officers and then you have policy and that policy being executed by the county commission. There's generally only one person in these counties that directly reports to the county commission and that's the county attorney. Everybody else does report to the board of county commissioners but individually and not through a county administrator or a county manager or a county coordinator. So if I'm a county commissioner from district number one and there's a pothole out in front of Aunt Emma's house and Aunt Emma has been calling me every day at 12 noon for the last six weeks, then me, as commissioner from district one, I am directly calling the public works director and telling the public works director, please go fix Aunt Emma's pothole. And that director of public works goes out and fixes the pothole. Why? Because that public works director reports directly to the board and not to a county administrator that all of the directives actually flow through. It's cumbersome, very, very cumbersome. Um, it tends to exist in places where um, you find a very homogenous if you will, lot, not much diversity in a particular community and certainly much more rural in nature. And you contrast this with the, admin, we're gonna go back to the executive, but to the administrator form of government um, is actually the most popular one in Florida today. Um, this one we have roughly 50 of the counties actually have this particular form of government. Um, they all came about around 1960, 19, in the 1960s and 1970s. The key difference here is that you do have a separation of governmental power between the legislative and policy function and the executive function. So the Board of County Commissioners enacts ordinances and adopts resolutions, but then hires an administrator to execute that policy and to oversee the various departments. And so the org chart in the administrator form looks something like this, where you actually have two individuals who directly report to the county commission, the county attorney and the county administrator, and then the public works director, the director for animal control, your solid waste director, parks and recreation, all those department heads are then hired and fired by the county administrator. And the Board of County Commissioners, if Aunt Emma continues to call me, and I'm a commissioner from District 1 in a county administrator form of government county, then the person I'm going to call is not the director of public works, but at a meeting, I am actually going to talk to my fellow commissioners and then hopefully persuade them to allow me to direct the county administrator to do that. So as counties started to grow up in Florida, we started to see a movement more towards this particular form of government. And then the last one is the executive form of government. Um, and we do not have many of these in the state of Florida at all. In fact, right now, only Miami-Dade, Orange, and Jacksonville Duval operate under this form of government. Um, this is where, again, you have complete separation from the legislative functions and the executive functions. 
but the person responsible for the executive functions is actually an elected official. So the elected chairman or an elected mayor. So in city speak, it would be like a strong mayor form of government, if you will. This form of government is only available to charter counties in Florida. So we have 20 charter counties in Florida, 47 of them cannot get here if this is what they think their community needs without having a charter form of government. Now, one sort of heads up on this issue, we have counties in the state of Florida that have the title of mayor associated with their chairman, but that person is really a ceremonial chair, just like you have in Manatee County, meaning that it is often rotated. That person is selected by the remainder of the county commission. It's just that the title is mayor. Um, it gets very confusing, but they are not an executive form of government. They look very much like all other counties with a full county commission and that person um, just having the title of mayor instead of having the title of chairman. The other thing is that some of our counties um, in Florida also have an elected chairman where that title of chairman is given to them and they are elected on a countywide basis, but they have no powers that another county commissioner does not also have. And so again, they are not actually this executive form of government. That We only have three that really qualify for that definition of executive form. All right, so which one of these fits? Which form of these governments? Because the one thing that a charter form of government allows you to do is it does give you additional choices over how that executive function gets carried out by your county government. This executive form is available in Florida to county governments, charter governments. While population size is typically one factor that we see, obviously the counties I mentioned are some of the largest in this state, Miami-Dade, Orange, Jacksonville, Duval. The traditional commission structure that we talked about first was designed for very small rural counties with a similar population makeup and a low expectation for services or for programs and little to no political difficulties or conflicts because most folks um, are of a similar mindset in some of our smallest, most rural counties here in the state. But as populations grow and diversify, more political conflict is inevitable and the demand for services and programs increases and it becomes difficult and inefficient to have the board make and implement policy and it runs afoul of the cherished political doctrine of the separation of powers to have legislative and executive all together. So as counties start to get bigger and more diverse, they start to gravitate much more towards the county administrator form and then in some of our largest counties in the state all the way to the executive form of government. All right, so policy is set by the county commission. Well, what about the other folks that we also elect on a countywide basis that operate at the county level, actually help make up what we all think of as county government? Property appraiser, the tax collector, the clerk of court, the sheriff, and the supervisor of elections. Um, each of these offices is also created by the Florida Constitution, and the duties and functions of these constitutional officers are also mandated by state law. So what their job is, is fairly well prescribed in the Florida statutes through the Florida case law as well. Um, not so much guidance that is provided in the Florida Constitution, but in the Florida statutes and in the case law, we find what their duties and responsibilities really are. And they round out, again, what we think of as county government. All right, so what is home rule? Brings us to this concept. It's the transfer of certain state powers to local entities in matters of local control, but it is not complete autonomy. 
Home rule is extraordinarily broad in Florida, as we'll see in just a second, but it does not mean that we at the local level, whether we are cities or counties, charter or non-charter, we are not creating our own kingdom with our own rules. We cannot run afoul of state law. We cannot run afoul of federal law, which includes constitutional provisions. So it really is having control over those matters of a more localized nature. So it does offer us more control over our own internal affairs and alleviates the need for state legislation of local concerns. The idea of home rule, of allowing a local community to either create its own opportunities in a way that is different from other counties in the state or allows us as a local community to solve our own problems here at the local level without seeking legislative input. Those are the ideas that I think are fairly consistent with self-governance and independent spirit that we have here in this country. Now, there's tension. There is tension that gets created when there is freedom. And so the freedom to help solve local problems or help create local opportunities often means that we have conflict internally, meaning among other local governments as well, which we'll talk about where we butt heads at times at the local level, and then also with the state in the area of unfunded mandates and in the area of preemption, which is just the label that we use to talk about when the state legislature actually limits our ability to solve local problems locally. We call those preemption. And you will actually find those words in the state statute that the state legislature has preempted to the state the authority over a particular area. And then finally, I've already hinted at the fact that when it comes to home rule, that non-charter counties also have home rule power um, in some ways similar to charter counties. And we're getting ready to get into that right now. Okay, not gonna read this to you. The next couple of slides though, um, I am providing to you by way of difference um, and by way of reference. And I want to point out a couple of key phrases, though, that we will get to a wrap-up slide here in just a second. So I mentioned the Constitution. So home rule comes from the Constitution. In 1968, um, in this state, there was a major initiative that came before, at that time, the Constitutional Revision Commission that was meeting in 1968. And that initiative was a home rule initiative that would provide cities and counties in the state of Florida with home rule authority. And in Article 8, Section 1F, with respect to charter counties, here's what the 1968 Constitutional Revision Commission put in on the ballot that went into the Constitution, that charter counties shall have all powers of local self-government. It shall have, so it's mandated directly from the Constitution, all powers of local self-government. If you look at the next page, what the Constitutional Revision Commission drafted and put before the voters, the next section of the Constitution, non-charter counties shall have such power, not all power, such power of self-government as is provided by general or special law. General or special law, that's legislative lingo. That means the legislature steps in. That is their domain. That is a big road sign. What we're talking about here is the state legislature. So those are the words here that we're focused on with respect to non-charter counties along with the phrase such power because it doesn't say all power. So two key distinctions there. And then for those of you who have actually been around a while, um, Sandy Dallenbert was the official commentator to the 1968 Constitutional Revision Commission. And what he said about these two provisions have actually borne 
been borne out in the 40 to 50 years since then. So what he said was, thus charter counties and non-charter counties apparently start from different poles, so they start from different places, so such power versus all power, and then we have legislative lingo, and then that doesn't exist for charter counties. In their relationship with legislative enactments, both could, so both charter and non-charter counties could conceivably be the same depending on the legislation adopted. Well, to cut to the chase, they did this. In 1969, 1970, and 1971, during those legislative sessions in Tallahassee in the state capitol, what the state legislature enacted were these very broad, uh, pieces of language in chapter 125 of the, of the Florida statutes which is that provision of state law that governs county governments primarily and essentially here is one of the phrases at the end what they said was the provisions of this section shall be liberally construed in order to effectively carry out the purpose of this section and to secure for the counties the broad exercise of home rule powers authorized by the state constitution. So it was a legislative grant of home rule authority, whether you were charter or non-charter county. So all of that language, the constitutional language, as well as the statutory language that you can go back and take a look at, it really means the following that the home rule power of a charter county in Florida is implemented directly from the Florida Constitution or the people of Florida. The home rule power of a non-charter county, so Manatee, is authorized, it's authorized by the Florida Constitution, but it is implemented by the Florida legislature. And what the legislature giveth, it can taketh away. So there's a middleman if you will, in non-charter counties. That middleman is the Florida legislature. The Constitution authorized the legislature to give home rule power to non-charter counties. They did that, 69, 70, and 71. It is extraordinarily similar in a lot of very broad ways. Charter counties, home rule power given directly from the Constitution, no state legislature as a middleman, which means directly from the people. So it's a little more voluntary too, and we'll talk about that. And often what we find in the state capitol is the legislature treating charter counties similar to municipalities because of this charter, because it came from the people, and because of the direct connection to the Constitution. All right, so again, another extraordinarily technical definition here. What is a charter county? It's a county whose citizens have approved a local charter granting the county government home rule authority directly from the Florida Constitution. So a charter county is most simply a county in the state of Florida that has a charter. Where are they? I know you can't read the county names, but you can see the yellow. These are the 20. And basically what you see here are the southeastern portion of the state is covered. So Palm Beach, Broward, Miami-Dade with charter counties. A little more south to you all in the southwestern part of the state, Sarasota, Charlotte, Lee. And then a little north to you, Pinellas, and then across the I-4 corridor over to Volusia. And then the more north you get, the more the counties are not yellow. <laughs> They are still white. Um, and when you get to that junction in Columbia County of I-75 and I-10 and you go west, there's only two. And they are relatively new, Leon and Wakulla. So this is where they are. Obviously population centered, but not exclusively, but certainly by way of majority. So when did they become charter counties? Well, our first one was actually back in 1957 before we even got home rule in 1968. Then in 1968 came Duval, a lot of movement in the 1980s and 1990s, and then the last three have actually been Columbia County, a small county, 
Leon County, which tried four or five times before it actually passed at the ballot, and Wakulla County, which is one of our small rural fiscally constrained counties in the state in 2008. The issues in terms of why a charter for a particular community seemed like a good idea at the time change over the history of charter counties in Florida. What we found from a political science perspective, those in the beginning, a lot of it had to do with the relationship between the county commission and the constitutional offices. Then when we get into the late 80s and the 90s, that issue was not so much on the front burner anymore. It was much more about growth and development and how could a community as a whole actually help itself with a community identity in the areas of growth and development. And then starting with Columbia, Leon, and Wakulla. Columbia and Wakulla being the two here, Leon being the exception to this particular rule. But then what we're seeing and what we're also seeing around the state in terms of interest at the community level is much more of a grassroots movement. So much more citizen driven um, and looking for increased participation in their county government. And there are ways to do that in a charter that don't exist in a non-charter county and we will talk about that. So it, depending on which era a county actually adopted a charter speaks to a little bit of what the local issues and the local drivers were, but there is not one theme that covers all 20 of them by any means. All right, so I have suggested to you that there's home rule for charter counties and for non-charter counties. So before we talk about really what the key differences are, um, I do want to make sure that I have hit home what this change in 1968 in the state of Florida meant in terms of our involvement at the local level in our own local issues. Um, what happened in 1968 in the Florida Constitution giving cities and counties home rule authority in Florida was a game changer and it was a game changer in the country. In that, prior to that, back to my non-technical definition of what a county is, that it was top down and really only existed to provide state level service or state services at the local level and perform state driven duties. Well, this is a complete opposite of that. This is completely, you all have the opportunity to govern yourselves at the local level and you're looking to the state legislature only to tell you when you cannot do something. Not what you can do, but what you cannot do. And prior to 1968 in Florida, we had already gotten large enough as a state that in 1966, in the legislative session, there were 3,000 local bills that passed. Now remember I talked about special acts applying just to a particular locality every time your community wanted to do something you figuratively had to get in your horse and buggy and go to tallahassee and ask for permission and that permission came in the form of a state law now it was a special act it only applied to you but if you wanted to raise the salary of you know in 1960s it, the title would have been dog catcher i'm sure today it's the animal control director but you wanted to raise their salary by $1,000, if you didn't already have authority to do it, you couldn't. You had to get a special act that passed the legislature in order to even make those basic governing decisions at the local level. After the full implementation of the 1968 constitutional provision in home rule, if you go to the seventh floor of the state capitol to the legislative library, there is then a volume of special acts in 1971 that has about 150, not 3,000, 150. So in just a very short period of time, to me of nothing else shows how significant this shift was to governing Florida on a statewide basis, not just in local communities. All right, there are differences between charter and non-charter counties, that's why you're here tonight. So there's really one overarching principle from my perspective, 
and it's that a charter provides a local community with the potential for government reform at the county level, period. A charter form of government in many of the counties that have enacted it don't look any different the day after the election than they did the day before. What is really different in those counties is the potential for reform of their local county government. That is in place. There is no question that then there is a document that your community has voted on that allows them to potentially and dramatically change county government over the course of time and through the amendment process. But by and large, it is just that potential and opportunity. We don't see that that actually bears out in actuality in terms of massive governmental change the day after a charter versus the day before. All right, so you get to choose your form of government. So back to our commission form, the administrator form, or the executive form, that is a choice that a charter can make for its community that a non-charter county cannot make. There is the power to levy taxes in the unincorporated areas of the county in certain circumstances that are not available to non-charter counties. Um, one of the most significant of these revenue sources um, is the public service tax is um, by way of um, court decision by way of judicial law. The law in Florida is that that particular tax, that if you look actually in Florida statutes, it only talks about municipal, 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 doesn't mention county anywhere, is that the courts have told us that in that circumstance, depending on the language that's in a charter, that revenue source can also be available to a charter county, but it is not available to a non-charter county. The power to alter the functions of the county officers, and we'll talk about um, that in a little more detail in just a section, sec, sec, second. The power to have countywide authority. Um, and this come, we'll talk about this in a second as well. Um, this comes in the following. The Florida Constitution, the one thing that the Constitution requires a charter to do is to make a choice and to make a choice in the area of which ordinances are going to prevail in the event of a conflict. So if the city of Palmetto adopts an ordinance that says um, buildings can go to 40 feet high and Manatee County adopts an ordinance that says they can only go to 25 feet high, which wins? Because obviously the city of Palmetto is inside the county of Manatee. Well, the one thing the Constitution tells us has to happen in a charter is that choice has to be made. So is Palmetto going to get its height or is the county going to get its height? That choice has to be made in the charter. And it may very well be that the charter picks the default position, which is that the municipal ordinances prevail in the event of that conflict and Palmetto would have its height restriction no matter what the county wanted it to do. But it could be the opposite. But that choice has to be in black and white and the citizens have to, vote, have to vote on it. Special acts in a charter county have to be approved by the electors. So have to be approved on a referendum ballot in order for them to actually limit the authority of your county government. Um, this is a protective measure against retaliation by the state legislature. Um, this comes from the 1968 Constitution and when there was a vision by those members of the Constitutional Revision Commission understanding what was going to happen with not needing so many special acts, they were still worried that some of those special acts might be retaliatory in nature from the legislature and actually seek to limit our authority at the local level. And so what the Constitution says about a charter county is that the legislature can't do that unless that special act, and so that limitation is actually put to a vote, a countywide vote at a referendum. That's not the case in a non-charter county. Citizen involvement can actually be increased in ways that legally cannot happen in a non-charter county. We'll talk about what those are. And then the only place tonight that I think you'll hear me talk about a benefit to a charter form of government is this one. 
and that is that in the state legislature, because a charter form of government at the county level is voluntary, very similar to a municipality, the state legislature tends to look more favorably upon those charter counties if what the legislature is doing is seeking to limit your authority. Because of those sort of traditional American ideals of local democracy and self-governance, there is some deference that is given to charter counties. And so you will find certain tax sources, for example, in the sales tax arena, where classifications are created for charter counties that a non-charter county cannot get access to. And you also, you find it in things that they're giving as well as things that they are taking away. Okay, so what choices in these particular areas exist? Legislative branch under the county form of government. What the choices that can be made in a charter are, what does the districting scheme look like? Do you want to keep your seven member board of county commissioners? Do you want to go back to five? Do you want to go up to nine? All of those choices can be made in a charter. You can also determine, is there going to be a mix of countywide commissioners that are elected countywide and a mix with single member? Are they all gonna be single member? Are they all going to be at large commissioners? Those are choices that can be made. What methodology? a nice way of saying that you can have partisan or nonpartisan elections for members of your county commission. Are you going to cap their salaries? These are provisions that we find in charters across the state. Terms of office. Are there going to be limits on the terms of your county commissioners? Again, these are provisions that we find in charters around the state of Florida. So term limits for county commissioners. Executive branch, an appointed professional administrator. Yes, this can exist, obviously, the professional administrator in a non-charter county, but what we often find in the charter are actually additional criteria for the administrator. Sometimes you'll even find the process for hiring and then terminating that particular individual. Is that the community has actually voted on how that administrator, what their educational background should be, what their qualifications are, how they get hired and fired are actually embodied in the charter itself. And then obviously we've talked about if you have an elected chairman or an elected executive form, those are also all laid out in a charter. So I gave you one example of the power to tax in charter counties um, that does not exist with respect to non-charter counties, the public service tax being one of those. The communication services tax is a tax that non-charter counties are authorized to levy, but the rate that a charter county can impose it at is higher. Um, there's an entire historical reason for that that we don't need to get into, um, but that's the way that the law is written. There are also certain local option sales taxes that are available to charter counties that are not available to non-charter counties. There's a whole host of miscellaneous tax sources, again, um, that create a distinction between charter and non-charter counties. And here's one. In the area of taxation, is that it's actually possible to limit the authority of the county government to levy taxes in a charter that is more limiting than exists in any non-charter county in the state. And so often, folks will get worried about additional tax sources, and yes, there are some, but the same is true on the other side of that equation, meaning that the charter is actually a vehicle to limit the power of taxation on a charter county. Um, Sarasota County was the poster child for this back in the 1980s. Um, they had to alter some provisions in their charter um, as it related to the power of, to limiting this particular power. The other constitutional officers, I think I mentioned to you that back in the 70s and in the early 80s that this was a large political choice um, or reason at least for sometimes for initiatives on charter government um, actually being raised in a particular community. 
These are the choices that exist under current law. Um, this is one of those areas, however, where things in the details can get a little more gray. Um, we, there is a case pending right now in the appellate courts in Florida coming out of Orange County that relates to a charter provision there and whether it is constitutional in terms of trying to make the constitutional officers nonpartisan um, non elected positions. And so there are some challenges, there are still some gray areas whenever we're talking about the relationship between the county commission and then what a charter can do with respect to the other constitutional officers. Um, but there are some choices that can be made and we see everything in Florida, in the 20 counties that are charter to complete status quo, where again, nothing is different for any of those constitutional officers the day after the charter is enacted as it was the day before all the way to the other end of the spectrum where we have counties through the charter that have actually abolished those offices and made them a part of the county commission structure of government. Those state duties still need to be carried out, uh, but we see it all across that spectrum with the, the constitutional officers. And so what happens at the other end of the spectrum is a charter might dissolve the office of the tax collector, but then all of those duties and functions fall under the county commission and there is a department head that is in charge of all of those state mandated duties. Countywide authority. This gets to the issue that I explained about the Constitution that the only thing it does require that a charter actually indicate is which ordinance is going to prevail in the event of a conflict. So the default position is that municipal ordinances will trump county ordinances. So that choice can be made, but it needs to be expressly articulated in the charter. The county ordinance prevails. Again, it has to be in writing and in the charter. The county ordinance prevails, but only in specific policy areas. And so again, we see this all across the spectrum, all across the state of Florida. And then finally, the county ordinances prevails, but the cities are permitted to have more stringent standards in certain circumstances. These are the general categories. There are some other nuances as well that are in here. One thing that I would say with the countywide authority is that, again, it provides a community, if a community so chooses to have county ordinances, let's say prevail, and let's make it easy, and for all purposes, is that allows a community in Florida to decide that they want their county government to be more of a regional form of government instead of just another form of local government. So regional in nature that actually has the entirety of the county in either particular policy areas or globally under county ordinance authority, so countywide authority. Citizen participation. What are the choices that can be made in a charter? Ordinances, as well as charter amendments, can be proposed by citizen initiative petition. And so charter counties in Florida, unlike non-charter counties, can have citizen initiative processes for the enactment of ordinances. That does not exist in non-charter counties in Florida. There's some policy issues that then have to be made in the charter itself as well. What percentage or distribution of the electorate is that petition process going to come from? Is it 5% of the electorate is enough? Is it 10%? Is it 10% but two from every district? Um, all of those choices need to be made in the charter, particularly um, if this is a provision that your community wants to include in the charter. Are there certain subject areas in a petition process that a community actually wants to take out of the hands of the people and leave exclusively in the county commission? That is also something that we see in charters across the state of Florida, is a initiative process for the enactment of ordinances except in the area of taxation. 
or except in the area of growth management, except in the area of environmental protection. And then what is the procedure for county commission action, particularly on the ordinances? Is it automatic? Does it go on the ballot? How does that work if it is an ordinance? All of that will be laid out in the charter itself. And then the power of recall. Um, a charter government with respect to the county commissioners, this is one of the few automatic things that does change when a county becomes a charter county is just like their counterparts at the <coughs> municipal level, recall is then automatic as a right of your citizens. And that right does not currently exist with non-charter county commissioners and citizens in non-charter counties. So this is another way that we actually see citizen participation um, increasing in a charter county is the opportunity for that. So how do you get there? How do you become a charter county? A couple of ways. A community creates a charter commission, which then sits and is appointed under state law. That commission can be initiated by a petition process that then triggers action that is state required by the county commission or the county commission on its own actually establishes a charter review commission. A special act. We have a couple of charter counties in the state of Florida that actually were created by legislative enactment. So it is a special act of the Florida legislature or an ordinance. We also have charter counties in the state that became a charter county by way of an ordinance that was enacted by the county commission and placed on the ballot. Often what you see in those counties, though, is very much a parallel track of citizen advisory committees that work very closely with the county commission on the drafting and the debate and the discussion on the proposed ordinance and proposed charter. Here's the key thing that is common to all of them, is no matter how a charter gets written, once it is written and once the process is triggered, it goes on the ballot for county-wide approval. Whether it comes by way of special act through the Florida legislature, whether the county commission enacts an ordinance that is the charter, or whether it comes by way of charter review. At the end of that process, that document goes on the ballot, and every elector in the county has the opportunity to vote up or down on it. So no matter how you get there, you get to the same place, which is the ballot. So of the 20 counties in the state of Florida, we have three that were actually the ordinance, I mean, I'm sorry, the charter came about by way of a special act of the legislature. The ordinance that was drafted by the county commission by one is sort of the majority. And then the remainder began or were initiated by a charter review commission. So pretty much a split between the ordinance and the Charter Review Commission is how they ended up going to the ballot in those particular counties. Well, once you have a charter, how do you change it? Well, you can amend it. And amendments can be proposed by the county commission, by a citizen initiative process, or by a Charter Review Commission. And generally, a Charter Review Commission um, as well as a citizen initiative process will also be explained in the county charter for amendments. Again, regardless of the issue or how the amendments are drafted, each amendment actually ends up again on a countywide ballot before it actually amends the charter. So here's one thing that I would like to suggest to you, and it is the following, that very contentious local issues are often not found in the original charter because they are so contentious that a community just won't stand for it being in the original charter and they want to debate those issues at the local level and as a community 
and on an individualized basis. And so often what we see are those com contentious issues actually becoming issues through the amendment process. In the amendment process, those issues then singularly are placed on the ballot. So all focus is on an individual issue. So if the issue of the day happens to be the city-county conflict and which height restrictions are going to apply to future growth and development, but that's not in an original charter in Manatee County, that actually sits on the ballot as an individual question, again, for the electors on a county-wide basis to vote for. Any amendments in the future are singularly placed on the ballot, not as a whole group of them, but just like we vote on constitutional amendments, they are then there singularly. All right, so what are the hot topics that we're finding around the state of Florida right now? Um, not so much at the county level, um, constitutional officer issues in terms of debate and discussion over charter provisions, but we're finding it at the legislative level. Um, there are a whole variety of reasons why I think that's happening. This last couple of sessions actually in Tallahassee have been several measures in terms of limiting charter. They were proposed constitutional amendments, which is how you would have to do it, but limiting the ability of a charter to limit the constitutional officer's power. Um, term limits has been a hot issue for about 10 or 15 years. Um, we now have 11 counties in the state of Florida that have term limits for their county commissioners in addition to the term limits in the legislature. So quite often with election cycles, um, we see this issue at least in one or two charter counties as an amendment um, each time there is a general ballot uh, salary cap adjustments is another one that we're also seeing on a statewide basis and has been the subject of some recent litigation, and by recent I mean about five years ago, um, as it relates to being able to place caps on the salaries for county commissioners. Um, their salaries, just like constitutional officers, are set by statutory formula. And so it's actually a lifting of that formula and placing a localized cap on their salaries. And then we're always dealing with legislative limitations and preemptions coming out of the state legislature. Um, there was one this past legislative session that did not pass that we were calling the super preemption bill that would have taken home rule and completely flipped it on its head. And in essence, it was a bill that said um, that cities and counties in the state of Florida could not enact any business regulations without having express permission from the state legislature, which for an entire segment um, of what we do at the local level, and regulation was defined in a way that it wasn't just bureaucratic red tape. Um, this was really hampering your local elected officials' ability to be able to assist, frankly, business development. Um, it did die a pretty ugly death, but it's still there, and we certainly expect that to also continue to come back. And then unfunded funded mandates is another area um, that is always around, and we see it coming from the federal to the state level, and then the state passed those also along um, down to us at the local level. But those are some of the issues um, that we're seeing around the state right now in terms of charters. Um, I will say that right now, I think that this community um, is the most active in the state at the county level that is looking at the charter form of county government. Um, every election cycle and leading into that election cycle, we'll have three or four counties typically around the state um, that will begin to look at it. I mentioned to you my home county of Leon County. Um, I think it was on the ballot four times before it actually passed in Leon. So these are far from done deals, um, even if a proposed charter makes its way to the ballot. Um, this really is one of those areas in the state of Florida where we have an opportunity at the local level to shape what our government looks like, what it acts like, how it responds to us as citizens and as a community, and again, the opportunity for any individualized community to be able to shape um, what it looks like in its future.
And with that, I will stop and I'm more than happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you for that very complete presentation. I want to first give the opportunity to anyone sitting at this table to ask questions before we go to public comments. So raise your hand and I'll try to call on you if you have questions. Madam Chair, could we at least offer Ginger an opportunity to get off her feet and return to her chair if she would be more comfortable doing that? I'll leave it to her. I can do whatever you'd like. I will tell you that I have burned approximately 158 calories today because <laughs> I've been in my car all day long, so I don't mind standing. <laughs> so, Madam Chair, whatever your pleasure is. We definitely know the feeling. I don't know how much longer I'm going to be able to sit because I've been exactly. sitting since 9 a.m. this morning. So. But it's your pleasure. I can Getting... move to the table if you would nope, like for me to. You're fine up there. Okay. If you want to stand, I may come join you. Um, any questions? Jean, Palin. Do you know whether, do you know, happen to know whether of the charter counties, whether there ever have been successful charter amendments to, you know, petition based? Yes, there have been. Um, in fact, often what we find in charter counties is, um, all of the, the policy decisions about what that petition process will look like is made in the charter, um, but yes, there are often ones that are successful that come from um, the citizen initiative petition, and I would offer to you that in the areas of um, term limits and salary caps in particular, that those we often see the subject matters of um, citizen initiative petitions. And I mentioned to you we have 11 counties with term limits. Um, we have about four or five counties with the salary caps as well. Um, and generally those are citizen initiative petitions. Thank you. Another question. Okay. Carol? Thank you. It was, it was very good. Um, the, uh, there's a, there was a Florida statute change in 2015. Our attorneys sent a memo around and I just would like that clarified. It was something about that uh, if you are a chartered government, you cannot vote or you, um, you, you can't, the citizens cannot vote on anything development related. And I may be saying it wrong, Mickey. Uh, Bill I'm had not sure sent that us. was a 2015 was statute. It 20, Bill Clay yeah, that, sent us a memo. That's a much older memo. statute, I believe. I thought it was current. Uh, it was 2011 and then amended oh. in 2012. Ginger, she's talking about 163.3167. I think it's a sub kind of issue. It was a subsection eight of that statute that basically said you cannot require in a charter that a development order go to referendum. And what do you mean by development orders? What I, I well, think I believe that the exact that. wording is it's a zoning change or an increase in density. I'd have to look at it, but it's. Okay. Basically, uh, prohibition on making development decisions subject to public referendum by charter or any other ordinance for that matter. It covers charters, but also your land development code. Okay, C could we please have you explain that if you are able to? And I'm not sure everybody could hear. You need to yeah. talk right into the microphone because the acoustics are obviously pretty bad in this room. Because I had a similar question about legislative uh, preemptions for what you can put in a charter. I thought you were going to go over that more fully here. I didn't hear that. So if you heard uh, our county attorney, if you could maybe expound on that. Yes. The issue, Madam Chairman, that has been raised globally by Commissioner Whitmore is those express preemptions like that. that exist in the Florida statutes. What is that relationship like to charter provisions? And here's the easy answer to that, and then I'll get to the more difficult answer. The easy answer is no charter can have anything in it that conflicts or is inconsistent with state law. So if there is a general law that says a county cannot do X, Y, and Z, a charter cannot say Mango County can do X, Y, and Z, and it be constitutional. So a charter does not get to trump state law. We run straight into a brick wall. That was back whenever I said it's a lot of authority at the local level to solve local issues or to create local opportunities, but it is not complete autonomy. We don't get to violate state law through charter provisions. We don't get to float throw out the entire federal constitution. So we don't get to trump state law at all. 
And then in terms of the list of preemptions, Madam Chairman, you have raised an issue um, that is difficult. And by that I mean that we have had I can't tell you how many study groups, how many lawyers actually take as a project and to list all of the preemptions that are in the state statutory scheme. Um, there, are mul there are hundreds of them um, in a variety of different areas. And the answer is, unfortunately, if this community wanted to look, for example, at the area of what could a charter provide in terms of tools in the local government's toolbox on growth management, then the Charter Review Commission or the County Commission or the Citizens Group or whoever is looking at that particular issue will then need to do the legal research to determine are there state laws that specifically preempt the, the path that we are wanting to take. And so it's an issue by issue determination that really has to be made. There is no grand list, unfortunately, that exists. Um, it's a similar exercise to trying to identify all of the unfunded mandates that actually exist. We know what the big ones are, um, but we don't know what all of them are. And so it is a constant ongoing research effort. Um, my recommendation would be to take it on an issue by issue basis um, and then to even the path that the community is looking at that then that needs to be analyzed itself well I'll, I'll try to drill down I guess a little bit to that I think what the specific question was just about um, growth management issues um, we know for example that Sarasota County has some um, super majority requirements and uh, maybe perhaps they even had a referendum requirement and we know of course Longboat Key had such a requirement but it's my understanding that those are now grandfathered in for those charter governments, but not available. Maybe the county attorney could comment on those specifically. Well, yeah. going back to the statute, am I close enough to the microphone? Yes. Going back to the statute, it, it applies to comprehensive plan map and text amendments. But it did grandfather in after it was already adopted a year later. They went back and grandfathered in those charters that had those requirements before the original enactment of the statute at the behest of the cities that protested it, it basically changed their charters without their consent. But for anyone after that, for any new charter that adopted today, for example, you can't put something like that in the charter. Now, going back to what Ginger said a minute ago, it is difficult to provide general advice about what you can or cannot say about growth and development in a charter. From a land use lawyer's perspective, the same language that I just talked about is in the Growth Management Act. And the Growth Management Act says you're supposed to put your development restrictions in your comprehensive plan and your land development code. And as Ginger said, your charter has to be consistent with general law, and that includes the Growth Management Act. Mm -hmm. So there's a real question in the minds, minds of land use lawyers about calling out specific development restrictions in a charter. I think that there'd be a lot of consternation about that if a commission went through the research and asked lawyers to weigh in on that. So I hope that helps to give you all some idea of, of how we look at, at the issue. And Madam Chairman, if I could just do one follow-up comment. Um, on the Florida Association of Counties website, we have a series of spreadsheets that compares and contrasts all 20 charter counties in the state of Florida and a whole series of provisions. It's also annotated. Um, it is about 40 pages long, however, which gives you some idea of the differences that even local communities make. So I, I did not make copies for all of you, but you can go and download it and print it out. Um, but what I would, as much as I love counties and as many counties as I have represented in an attorney-client relationship, just because something is in a charter does yeah. not mean that it is constitutional. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Our folks find that out the hard way. So I, I mean that with all sincerity. Um, oftentimes there are provisions that you may find even in the majority of charters that turn out to be unconstitutional. So. You, just you really issue by issue and an analysis of each of those issues um, because just because somebody else has it doesn't mean it's going to work here number one and doesn't mean that it is actually lawful I've got some other questions but I'll go Randy if you had some questions. yes Randy Cooper West Manatee um, you talked about Charter Review Commissions which is a group of citizens elected by 
I guess, their peers or citizens. Is there the potential for these for this commission to be influenced by, let's say, a special interest that could maybe sway the board to, to go a certain way? Have you seen that before? Sure, there's the potential. I mean, they are going to be making decisions, um, but I would suggest that one of the things you might look at is if you have any um, local ethics ordinances that might also apply to them um, they're going to be subject probably to sunshine law so the transparency is also going to apply to them um, as well as public records obligations so there's a lot of the safeguards that we already have in Florida with respect to how we interact with our government and what we expect in a transparency standpoint, um, yes, for all of that to still apply to a charter review commission. Um, the other thing is, sure, I mean, it's going to be, as I mentioned, a group of folks who are making decisions, um, and I would imagine that there are people who are going to want to talk to them, and they may actually even represent in their own right, individually, certain segments of your community. So it's a decision-making process just like any other. Thank you. Other questions? All right. I, I wanted to follow up on that Charter Review Commission. Are you required, if you have a charter, to have a Charter Review Commission? No, Madam Chairman. Um, the Charter Review Commission, if a, if a citizen initiative petition is undertaken to create a Charter Review Commission, then when the state statutory standards are hit, because it is articulated in Chapter 125, once you hit that threshold with a number of petitions, there is an automatic process that then begins to trigger by operation of state law. And so in that circumstance, then a Charter Review Commission um, is to be appointed. And it is either appointed by the county commission or by the legislative delegation. If it comes that way, then no member of the county commission and no member of the legislature, however, can sit on the Charter Review Commission. So while the appointment power lies with those two groups, none of them can actually be a part of the Charter Review Commission. But you don't have to have one unless that citizen initiative process is the one that is triggered. And I wanted to ask because the pre, um, the, uh, exemptions, the, the preemptions that were being proposed this legislative session were pretty broad. Are you, if you're a charter government, are you protected from those preemptions? I mean, they, wa they wanted, the, the way I understood the legislature and talking to some of them during the session was they wanted to make sure that governments, for example, did not, local governments did not pass laws that said you're going to prohibit a chain store. I was told this. Yeah. You're not going to adopt laws that's going to prohibit the use of plastic bags. You're not going to, and I these were explained, this was the reason why that legislation was pending. Kind of opened my eyes, but you're not exempt from that just because you adopt a charter, I assume, that was, wouldn't have been their intent. Now, Madam Chairman, it was not their intent with the legislation that was filed. Um, what one would have to do ultimately is examine the, le the language of any particular legislative enactment because this back to my comment that usually the, the only time you'll hear me use the word pro or benefit with respect to charter um, because I do fundamentally believe that that is a local community's decision whether they have one and then what is in it is that the legislature does tend to look at charter counties differently and in a more beneficial way. But the bills that were filed during this legislative session, the way they were filed would not have given credence to that. It would have treated all cities, all counties exactly the same in terms of the operation of the preemption. Okay, thank you. Carol? I was involved um, the last time we went through this. Uh, I was a, an elected official in a city. There's a lot of cities here. There's constitutionals here. We haven't really mentioned that. I know a charter, and tell me if I'm right or wrong, or if you could tell me, charter governments can also limit, um, appoint the sheriffs, appoint all the constitutionals, can limit their um, time in service. As, as a city official, I know the cities were very concerned because the county would prevail on a lot of our decisions, our land use decisions. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we uh, fought it, and that's why the constitutionals fought it. And it's not really like we fought it, but we, you know, we believed the cities that we had home rule. 
So can you answer some of those questions? Sure, absolutely. Madam Chairman, if I may. Um, going back to this slide, and I mentioned that there is a spectrum. Um, if you go to that spreadsheet on the Association of Counties website that I mentioned, in the area of both which is going to prevail, a city ordinance or a county ordinance, there are pages of analysis of differences that different charter counties have made. And so the majority of counties stick with the default position in the charter, and that is that city ordinances prevail. Outside of that, my recollection is there's only two or three charter counties in the state that then have county ordinances that prevail in all circumstances. What you find in between there are typically single issues where the county ordinance is going to prevail over the municipal ordinance. Let me give you an example. Volusia County, everything in Volusia County is about the beaches. It just is. And actually this was a citizen initiative petition and an amendment that actually had the county ordinances trumping municipal ordinances any time the regulation of the beach was involved. Because for the community in Volusia, the beaches is the sole economic engine and they wanted one rule to apply. If I were to take my Jeep on the beach in Daytona, they wanted to make sure that I could go up and down the entirety of the beach in my Jeep with the right permit all up and down Volusia County and not have to get off the beach at Municipality 1, go down the road, and then I could get back on at Municipality 2, come off. I mean, you see what I'm saying? So that's one circumstance where, uh, by way of amendment, the charter was amended that actually the county ordinances were going to prevail over the city ones in a particular circumstance. Um, with respect to the constitutional officers, the spectrum is very similar. The vast majority of charters treat the constitutional officers exactly the same as they were before they became a charter county. The next category is they keep the duties exactly the same, they are elected as they have always been elected on a countywide basis. Nothing is done to their budgetary authority, but that they actually make them charter officers. What does that really mean? Well, what that does really mean is that it opens them up to an argument that there is some control by the charter over them. And in some counties, then term limits have been applied to those constitutional officers, for example, in that circumstance. But operationally, nothing is different. But then you have the other extreme, where entire constitutional offices are abolished. Um, we had, I think it was Volusia, um, back in the 1970s or 1980s, actually abolished the, share, the office of sheriff and created an office of public safety and a director of public safety and made that individual an appointed official almost as a city council would do for a police chief. That level of authority. They have shifted through the amendment process over time um, that that individual is now back to being a countywide elected official, um, but it still carries that title. And so that's the other end of the extreme. And so you see charters, again, at every point in there, but the vast majority actually don't change them at all. Okay, with nobody else, I'm gonna one go, quick, oh, Jean. Just one quick, do you, does the Florida Association of Counties have any concern that given the state constitutional um, panels, committees, whatever they call that committee that's meeting, that the provision for home rule may disappear from the Florida Constitution? We, we tend to be a little paranoid in that regard, so sure, we live concerned. Um, but having said that, I, I have not seen anything yet from the dais of the Constitutional Revision Commission this time around. Um, that indicates that we will see that coming, but they're just on their listening tour. Um, there have been positive comments from the audience um, and members of the public 
at a variety of their stops, being sure and suggesting to the commissioners that they maintain the strength of home rule in Florida for cities and counties. So we haven't heard anything yet, um, but that doesn't mean that something won't come. But we have no indication yet that something um, in a limitation type environment will come out of this Constitutional Revision Commission. Brian? Are there usually driving issues that make counties want to change? And what historically with all these other 20 counties, was there something happening during those time periods that um, made them change? Because there's a lot of different events. I know Wakulla County at that time was financially having some, some big issues. So uh, what's driving these counties to change? I know our, our government's not broke, our constitutional officers, uh, there's nothing wrong with their department. So why are we looking at it? It, it is very different in different counties. Um, we talked about that historically, if you look at some of the ones in the 70s and 80s, the issue there often, and this is not, this does not mean everybody, but just as a generalized issue, that it was the relationship between right. the county commission and the constitutional officers that was one of the driving issues um, behind a charter initiative in those counties. When you get into the later 80s and into the 90s, growth management was much more um, on the front burner for folks in terms of why they were, why a community was looking at a charter as a potential way for the community to be able to shape itself. Um, and then whenever you move into the late um, 90s and into this century, it is dramatically different. Each of those counties, particularly Columbia, Leon, and Wakulla, very different issues going on. Columbia and Wakulla were both citizen-driven, um, and it was term limits and salary caps, period. That's all it was in both of those counties. Um, Leon, it, we just, it took forever. Um, it started out because it started out basically 12 years before it was ever enacted. So it started in the era of constitutional officers. And then they moved through the era of growth reform um, and growth management. And what we ended up with was really just a starter charter, which is just what we call a charter that basically the government looks exactly as it did the day after, as it did the day before, and that's the one that passed. So it's. It's all over the place in terms of um, why they even grew up in particular counties and at particular times. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna go to public comment. We have a microphone right here, unless you feel the need to go to the lectern, which you have that option. Um, but if you're just gonna speak, this one's closer, unless you've got a presentation, but you only get three minutes. Everyone gets three minutes to address the board. Uh, the entire group here. So I would ask you to please come to the micro microphone, state your name for the record, and then you'll have three minutes. I'm going to read the cards off, but anyone who's here will have an opportunity to speak, even if you haven't turned in a card. So, but I'm going to go in the order of the cards turned in. First up, I have Ed Goff. My name is Ed Goff, I'm a citizen of Manatee County. But first I'd like to thank the speaker, Ms. Dalligal. Excellent presentation, answered a lot of questions, and um, I think there are still a lot of questions around. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Rosalie Schaefer for spearheading uh, things along the citizen, and of course uh, the commissioners, I know you've had a, a tough week, it's been a long week with a lot of meetings all day and made a lot of tough decisions. My question, <clears throat> since uh, if the commissioners do not approve this, uh, uh, the, we are in the process of getting petitions signed. What I would like to know is what are some advantages to the commission? Why would the commission want to go with this charter, what would make them, help them make, make that decision to appoint a charter committee so that we could do this without having a petition? Um, and generally, uh, 
what are the, say, five advantages to the commission and, say, five top advantages to the citizens of the county? Thank you. Okay, I have um, Rosalie Schaefer to be followed by John Ozer. I'm not sure. Well, John, you're there. I'm sure Rosalie will let you go first since you're standing there. But Rosalie's up next. But go ahead, John. No, we, we don't. We do public comment, and then the questions will be answered. Thank you. So she's writing them down. That's where normal workshop. You don't mind, Rosalie, if John goes first, do you? He's yeah, already standing there. Thank you. John, okay. you can speak. All right. My name is John Hoser. <clears throat> Excuse me. I live in northwest Bradenton, the unincorporated area. And uh, I was very pleased to hear our guest speaker tonight, a very good presentation, that one of her interests is home rule. Because home rule is what I'm concerned with. We in our neighborhood have been bothered by a lack of home rule. If you'll permit me, and I have three minutes, I'm going to cut my presentation down. But um, for years, uh, up until 2011, the Florida legislature believed that local jurisdiction could handle the responsibility of zoning their areas. In June 2011, the lawmakers passed House Bill 883, which forbade local governments from regulating, restricting, prohibiting vacation rentals. That's the key thing. You've heard of probably Home Away, and there are others. Uh, they caused a lot of problems. By the year 2014, complaints came rolling in to the commissioners and to the government, but uh, to the legislators, from their loyal home-owning constituents who live next to these rental houses, who realized they were thrown under the bus by our representatives in the state for the benefit of rental organizations such as Home Away, what have you. And for, and this was done because they were visited by lobbyists. Now in, in April, and that, excuse me, they had the complaints. And so in April 2017, the short-term vacation rental itch again, by the way, I should say in 2014, they reversed that decision. In 2017, a short-term uh, vacation rental itch once again hit the legislature. And um, make it short here. The uh, House, the Representative's House of Careers and Competition Subcommittee passed Home Bill 8425, I mean 425, which again prohibited the denial of the uh, vacation homes. Um, I wanted to know whether Home Rule Charter would prevent us from being ruled by the legislature who can negate our zoning laws as if we locally people didn't know what we need and what we want in our zoning. It seems incomprehensible that the legislature would do this to the good, solid, homeowning citizens. Um, the rental houses are not what our legislature think they are. For instance, in our neighborhood, which caught my attention because this house is right across the pond from us, is owned by a lady from Canada. It is not intended that to be her future vacation home when she comes to America. She owns four of these in our community. <laughs> it's a business. Now, for some reason or other, we are allowing a business in the middle of residential zoning. Okay. And I'm hoping the charter will prevent that. Thank you, sir. Um, next up is Rosalie Schaefer to be followed by uh, Ernest Sandy Marshall. Good evening, and thank the county commission very much for uh, scheduling this workshop. We really appreciate that. And also thanks to Ms. Delgle for her excellent talk. We've certainly learned a lot tonight. Um, and I also, um, before I go into the issues, I want to point out that the League of Women Voters of Manatee County, which I'm president of, has been active in this issue since 1985. This is not something new for us. We saw back then that this was a superior form of government that our county could benefit from. And over the years, from time to time, we've come out with uh, a, uh, a, a um, 
campaign to obtain it. And um, we uh, started this one because we got so many questions from the voters after the last general election. Uh, a lot of the citizens in Manatee have friends in Sarasota. And so their friends tell them that all the things they were able to vote on and they started wondering why can't we do this too. And I had to tell them, well, they have a charter government and we don't. Um, wouldn't it be better if we could make the changes we wanted without getting permission from the legislature? We could shape our county government to meet the needs of our growing county. We suggest that the county um, appoint a charter commission to study uh, and draw up a charter. And we suggest that the first charter be what Ms. Delago called a starter charter with the required structure, the elements, recall and referendum, but mostly keeping things the same. And that's because if you present something to the public full of changes, everyone would find something they didn't like and it would not be successful. And we also recommend that the county address the concerns of the cities. We have heard a lot from the cities and they're worried about this. They're worried about preemption. And while my online research has not turned up any examples of city-county strife caused by charter preemption, after what happened in the early 2000s in this county with a proposed charter that was deeply flawed and it did indeed impinge on the city's autonomy. And unfortunately, they, they are concerned. And uh, I would suggest that a part of the charter be that the uh, city ordinances will prevail in the cities. And they will not be preempted unless they ask to be, unless they prefer to adopt this, the county ordinance. And we also recommend that the constitutional offers, officers' positions not be changed and have that in the charter as well. I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rosalie. Um, Sandy Marshall to be followed by Shirley Orr. Did I pronounce that right? Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'm Ernest Sandy Marshall. <clears throat> Been a resident of Manatee County for 65 years. And I've also served as a uh, uh, city attorney for one of our island municipalities and the three mayors. So I know quite a bit about all this. Uh, I'd like to read a letter for the benefit of the other officials here from other than the county commissioners because the county commissioners were sent this letter. It's been produced by the Federation of Manatee County Community Associations of which I'm first vice president. Uh, <laughs> Dear Commissioners, the Federation of Manatee County Community Association recommends that the County Commission authorize and form an exploratory committee to start the initiative for charter government in the unincorporated areas of Manatee County, since our cities are already charter municipal cor uh, corporations and, co and governments. <clears throat> After reasonable time to properly conduct public workshops to properly vet this home rule concept, the committee should then be authorized to write a proposed charter to submit to the public for review. Then it should be placed on a referendum at a proper time to be voted on. At the pace that Manatee County is growing, the citizens of the county rightfully feel the need to have more of a say on how Manatee continues to thrive, grow, and protect the quality of life issues that we all cherish. This recommendation will allow our commissioners to expedite and eliminate the need to obtain approximately 35,000 signed petitions by our residents to force this recommendation. Also, your cooperation in approving this recommendation is an opportunity for the county commissioners to demonstrate to our residents your willingness to allow them to feel you are working with them to protect, preserve our county, for the good of all concern. So I think what's been said by previous speakers tonight 
is that we're not trying to throw the baby out with the dishwater. And we're not trying to reinvent the mousetrap here. This county has constitutional officers. We've got county commissioners. We've got beautiful cities here. We've got a lot of people in this room here at this table especially that are working for the good of this county. And I'm here because I've lived here long enough to want to see it to continue. And I, what I'm suggesting to you is that don't get alarmed, cities, or any of you public officials that we're going to fire all of you and cut your salaries. That's not what this is all about. We want to be able to make this county stay in a way that we like from a low-profile community. We don't want a Miami Beach here. We don't want huge industry here. And we don't want another Disney World here. We want to keep this county in a very pristine, livable condition and not destroy all the amenities that we enjoy. Thank you. And thank you, uh, the lady that put on this uh, uh, bulletproof today. That was excellent. Okay. Uh, Shirley, yeah. Shirley Poor here to be followed by Katie Parola. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you for the very informative uh, presentation this evening. Over the past months and years, our county has been subjected to substantial development with very little regard to water supply, congestion on our highways, and um, effect on our environment. Do I understand correctly that even with charter government, the community does not have a bigger voice in how our county resources are used does the petition option even help us? Because, you know, this is our community, that we pay the taxes on it, and we have to bear the effects of the developments that are not necessarily as good for us as they might be. Um, that's it. Thank you. Katie Parola to be followed by Katherine Edwards. That's all right, Katie. Uh, I don't know if the mic could have been handed to her. I don't know. Do you want him to bring you the mic? I'm sorry. Somebody should bring her the mic. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank these county commissioners and mayors and gov whoever we got here. This is a wonderful event today. Thank you all so much. Thank you. I want to especially thank Rosalie Schaefer. I know she was thanked. She's been working hard as you can be. I want to thank Barbara Elliott, who has worked her heart and soul out, and especially Ed Goff. You just saw him here. You can't imagine the work he's been doing. OK, so there's the thank yous. I've lived in a chartered city. And it was Bradenton Beach. And our John Chappie's right here. Carol Whitmore from Holmes Beach. I don't know if there's anybody else. They know how these charters work. The Bradenton Beach Charter is terrific. A small little city with a charter. I just want to give you a little bit of an example, just a teeny bit example of what happened with this charter. We had a gentleman that wanted to take away our parks and our public little lots. And he never knew what our charter said. Our charter said it had to go to referendum before we got rid of our parks and what little public land Braid Beach has. I feel as though that the charter would be the same as what we have now, except added things to it. It shouldn't scare anybody at all. And the major, major thing I want to say today is this. And Carol Whitmore, thank you so much for bringing it up. And that is that we did try to have a charter a couple of times way back yonder. They were terrible. What it did was it gave an umbrella that said, that all the cities would do what the county said regarding density and zoning changes. 
And that is the thing that I'm a fearing in Manatee County, and that's why I'm here. And let's see one more thing, and that is please don't confuse that old charter with what's been talked about today. It's old, antiquated, it doesn't mean a thing. And that is what I think people are afraid of. So what I'm saying is, if you have the pros and the cons, just think about this. The Baruf, poor Mr. Baruf, I'm sorry, he's a businessman just trying to make money just like everybody else. But he wants to build this thing over there near Longbar, Longbar Point and I'm so afraid of what he'll do to our island, even with our charter. That's what I'm afraid of. These guys are so smart and so slick, they keep coming back and coming back to make these changes. And we sure don't want South Beach on Anna Maria Island. Thank you, Katie. And that's all I got. Thank you. Thank uh, you Catherine much. Edwards will be Thank followed you. by Glenn Gibellina. Thank you, Catherine Edwards. Um, I want to thank the commissioners um, for holding this workshop. I think it's badly needed. And I'd also like to thank uh, Ms. Delegal uh, for a beautiful presentation, and I hope she has a pen handy to answer some of the questions that have already been proposed, including the following. With a, um, a charter government for the county, my question is, how um, does that affect uh, fire districts and school districts? Can the county um, uh, consolidate fire districts, for example? Um, with respect to constitutional officers, we had um, um, tax collectors and property appraisers, for example, present their budget um, to the commissioners and then the Department of Revenue. With a charter government, does it have any more control over the budgets that are presented and the changes that can be made to that budget? Um, one example might be um, the state attorney today stated that uh, under Florida statute, and it was corroborated by the county attorney, um, is obligated to um, fund an IT uh, budget for the state attorney. Well, with the charter government, is it possible to, for the county to have any bigger say over the funding levels uh, for that government. And um, along the lines of bringing a charter government um, um, to the voters, has, the, um, has Ms. Delegal noted whether or not it's um, more useful for um, constitutional offers to be appointed by the uh, Board of County Commissioners, um, per se, or is it better to leave them elected and in order to gain the constitutional support, since it does seem that they have to cede some power. Thank you very much. Thank you. Glenn Giblina is the last signed up speaker I had, but if anyone wants to line up, you'll have three minutes. You just have to go to the microphone and state your name for the record. So Glenn, go ahead. For the record, Glenn Giblina taxpayer and community activist. I have a public comment here that I'll read. Uh, also noted uh, some of the quotes. The charter is like a mini constitution for a county or town. The charter spells out the powers, duties, and structures of county government, reducing legislative interference of local affairs, allowing citizens to determine the form and administrative organizations of their local government relieving the state legislation of time consuming special legislation, granting citizens a greater voice in the de determination of local government policies, thereby encouraging many more citizens to become interested and participate in local affairs. So we might even get a time certain for public comments at the next BOCC meeting if we had a charter government. It relieves the state legislator of burning legislation, I said that. Uh, greater voice there and here's the misconception I looked at this and I said well 20 out of 67 that doesn't sound like very many 
So 47 must not like it. Until you dig a little deeper, in which I did, and maybe this can be verified, uh, we have charter governments all around us, Pinellas, Sarasota, Polk. Out of the 20, out of the 20, on a recent census dated, these counties represent 80% of the state's 17 million people. So in essence, Manatee County, we are in the minority. And it's funny, if this was on the, on the state constitution and 80% voted, it would be a no-brainer. We would all be charter governments. So I think there's a misconception that the 47 counties are the minority. They're less than 20% of the folks in this state. So I encourage the, uh, the charter government. I think it would be more active for the citizens. And uh, thank you for this workshop. So I'm going to hand in my public comment. And a lot of stuff here, Mr. Palmer, I did uh, quote who I quoted for you. Excellent. Thank you. Anyone else who wants to speak, please come forward and state your name for the record. Michelle Grimsley, a Manatee County resident, born and raised. I do not know a lot about the topic of charter government, but um, I'm here to learn about that. And my question, I have two questions. First of all, the energy and the manpower that it would take to create this charter government, from my understanding, do the benefits outweigh what it would take to go into creating this charter government? And did I lose my second question? I may have, but okay. Ms. Delegal, thank you for the information. I will continue to do my own research. My name is Al Zimmer, and I'm a Northwest re resident, and my wife is a native of Florida, Bradenton. Anyway, I have a couple of questions that I want to ask. Uh, if an elected official does not fill out his term of office, Right now, the governor comes along and puts in somebody he wants. Does home rule say that we can do it and elect our own rather than the governor? That's my first question. And does it, in home rule, does the citizen have more say in the budget, in the process of, of the budget? And I guess that's about it. And it's a good, good presentation. Thank you. Anyone else who would like to address the board, please come on forward. Just state your name for the record. We'll have three minutes. My name is Arlene Flissick. Uh, thank you for the presentations and giving us a better idea of what this is all about. I've tried to think ahead as this went on, and I'm wondering, there are various ways where the city, excuse me, the county, and the state interact with each other. And one of these ways is through grant programs where the state makes funds available for certain good purposes if the locality can meet certain requirements. Now, if we become a charter system and change some of the details about what we do and how we do it, are we necessarily complicating the way we would go about and be eligible for receiving grants for some programs that we would like to have their, fund, their funding for. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Anyone else? Please come forward. State your name for the record. Larry Grossman. I live on the Manatee Counties side of the uh, of Longboat Key and uh, uh, what I wanted to say is that I, I think you should uh, the, the county should uh, seriously consider a uh, home rule through a charter if, not going into specific items but overall it gives you the citizens more say it's a more democratic form of government and that alone should be sufficed to justify uh, proceeding along this line. And it gives everyone a lot more flexibility about the future, which is somewhat unknown. But uh, with that form of government, I think we'll have better governance and a more democratic form of uh, government. 
So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? <laughs> All right. I don't see anyone else coming forward. You guys will let me know since I can't turn my head around 360 degrees. Um, so at this point, I'm going to go ahead and close public comment. Um, Ms. Delegal, I think you're kind of on the hot spot here. If you would like to respond to the questions, if you heard it, I think we'd appreciate that. My pleasure, Madam Chair. Um, we'll start at the top. And back to my speech on advantages to five advantages to the county commission and five advantages to the citizens with the charter form of government. Um, my blanket answer is advantages, disadvantages, pros, cons um, are in the opinions of the community. And it may not make sense, some of the charter provisions that work very well in other counties might make absolutely positively no sense to Manatee and be frankly the worst thing ever. Um, so in terms of advantages, I'll save my comments um, to talk about some of the authority and protections in the areas of home rule um, with respect to the relationship of the county as a region to the state legislature. Um, let's see, vacation rentals, home rule concerns, would a charter necessarily provide any additional protections at the county level? Um, the answer is maybe, maybe not. Again, depending on what the actual language of the legislation is. Um, what we have seen in the policy area of vacation rentals and it's home away, it's Airbnb, it's VRBO, um, it's all of those different platforms fall generally within this industry category. Um, the preemptions are blanket in nature. They are highly generalized in nature. They would apply to cities and counties across the board. So we have not seen anything at the state level that would provide the opportunity yet for a charter county um, to keep protections at the local level for property owners with respect to vacation rentals. So as a blanket answer, the answer is it depends on the language in the state legislation. Again, the charter cannot lawfully either save power or impose limitations or frankly do anything that would conflict with state law. So if state law says that we can't do it at the county level, the charter does not get to trump that. Um, I'll go ahead and actually take this opportunity though, because there were a couple of different questions about this concept of protection for home rule with respect to the state legislature. And my comment and my answer to that entire category of questions is the following, that what we find in the legislative process is that the process can often be with their relationship with local governments story driven. And so often those stories are not favorable to local government. So it may be a disgruntled developer who went through a contentious um, development order approval process. Things did not go well. They may have taken the judicial route. They may not have. They may be um, a very um, successful developer. And frankly, at some times, it is less expensive to change state law than it is to get local officials officials to change their mind because local officials, whether you're county or city, you know what a development will do to your community, good and bad. And so with things being story driven, often they are bad stories, but sometimes they are good stories. And we have examples in this state where charter counties have placed provisions in the charters that provide for good stories to be told. Um, the Brevard amendment that I mentioned in terms of having a regional approach to their major economic driver on the beaches is one of those stories that we are able to use in the state legislature that if a blanket preemption 
like some of the ones that we see comes down, then if we have charter provisions that are working, that are innovative, that in particular in the political environment that we're in, if they are actually somewhat pro-business in nature, then those provide then the basis for creating a legislative classification that might actually take charter counties out of a preemption because there are good stories and innovative solutions going on at the local level. Um, years ago in the at the height uh, in the bubble of the market in the housing market in the state of Florida we had a handful and by that I mean literally like two counties that were charter forms of government that had provisions in their charters that created countywide planning and zoning commissions, but not of the type that often you see in counties in the state of Florida. They were actually appointed boards with exclusive authority um, under the law at the time to make some of the development decisions, and I'm oversimplifying, I understand, but they were highly successful in some of our most densely populated counties, and those stories, those good stories and effective government stories being told in terms of of how those communities then worked with the development community to help create communities that made sense for them locally actually allowed us to get some, we call them carve-outs, carve-outs for charter counties because there were good stories being told. So as a blanket answer to several of these questions about protection for home rule, I will say again that there isn't anything that we can do that is going to conflict with state law and the charter, but that often a charter has provided tools to a local area to actually create innovative solutions that then allow for good stories and for the legislature to treat those counties differently in the preemption world. Um, Let's see, the next question that I have that was, uh, that how does the charter affect possibly the consolidation of fire districts? Um, I'd like to approach this particular question from the standpoint of consolidation of services generally, whether it's fire, whether it's water, whether it's ambulance. Um, Yes, a charter can address those issues of consolidation of services and functions. Sometimes there are then additional provisions under the Constitution that get triggered. We don't need to go down that rabbit trail, but there may need to be dual referendums even when the charter issue, meaning it's a city-county issue and a city-county consolidation of services. But yes, a charter can in fact address um, and the question was related to fire districts, but fire districts. But a charter and having a charter form of government does not necessarily equal a consolidation of those services. That language would have to be in the charter in order for that to happen. So a charter generally, no, unless it is actually in the charter um, to deal with that. Pinellas County a couple of years ago um, actually had some amendments to their charter. I think they have seven, upwards of 17 um, fire control districts in Pinellas County. This was one of the major issues facing the Charter Review Commission. Um, it did not ultimately make it through that process and it was not an amendment that ultimately went on the ballot, but it would have been a consolidation and a realignment of the fire, fire protection um, special districts within the state. So yes, it can be addressed in a charter. Um, just because your charter doesn't mean that it, those consolidations take place. Um, constitutional officers, any more control over the budget process? Again, not necessarily. Um, just because a county becomes a charter county, again, there need to be provisions in the charter that deal with it, but those provisions cannot conflict with state law. So the budgetary process that is articulated in state law, um, there are only certain ways to get around that in a charter. Um, so just by being a charter does not equate to there being more budgetary control um, over constitutional officers unless that issue is expressly addressed and can only be addressed in a way that does not otherwise violate state law. Um, 
Similarly, on the IT budget for the state attorney, um, there are provisions of state law as well as Florida constitutional issues that govern what the county commission has to pay for with respect to the state court system. Um, IT for the state attorney and the public defender is one of those. I'll leave it to your county attorney as to what your level of discretion within that sphere is, but there are some state laws that, again, the charter could not run afoul of. Um, one in the Constitution and one in a statutory provision. And grant programs. Um, oh, shoot, I'll get to that one in just a second. Um, return on investment is what I wrote down in terms of a question. Do the benefits of a charter outweigh the resources that go into um, researching, analyzing, drafting the charter, I'm assuming even then the administrative costs and budgetary impacts of, of having an issue on the ballot, sh those costs are real, they are hard costs, there's no question about that. Um, whether there's a return on the investment for community again, for the community again, is a decision um, that the community has to make in terms of the investment of those resources and whether it did in fact pay off um, in the form of the charter for you. Home will allow, oh, unexpired terms of county commissioners. Um, when um, a midterm vacancy exists on the county commission, can a charter um, trump what the governor has in terms of the powers of appointment? The answer is likely no. Um, many of those provisions in terms of the, the governor's appointment powers are actually laid out in the Constitution, and then there's, there are even two separate processes depending on how much time is left in a county commissioner's term. Um, so there, uh, there are some very limited areas um, in that regard. Can the citizens have more of a say in the budgetary process in a charter government? Um, again, the county budget process is highly um, regulated by the state. Um, through DOR and also by state law. So again, there would be narrow areas for direct citizen involvement in the budgetary process because the charter could not run afoul um, of state law. That is not to say, however, um, that a particular charter provision couldn't in um, isolated circumstances or narrow parts of the budget process provide for additional citizen input. Um, question related to if there are any ways in which a charter could complicate actually the process of applying for grant programs. Um, the answer depends on the language that is in a <laughs> charter. So for example, if certain revenue sources are actually limited or eliminated by a charter provision in a county, um, if those revenue sources make up local matches for grant programs, then obviously the answer is yes, you've created quite a complicating factor for then drawing down the grants. Um, in addition, if there are changes in responsibilities for, um, we'll just say the constitutional officers that might otherwise impact a grant application, um, then there, yes, there may also be some additional complications that take place. But again, that's all just going to depend on what is in the charter, not just because a county becomes a charter county, is that necessarily the conclusion? Those were the ones I had, Madam right. Chairman. Thank you. Wonderful um, response. Commissioner De Sabatino. Yeah, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Can you hear me? A um, couple questions that just came to mind listening to uh, the uh, information today um, regarding charter versus non charter, regarding um, referendum and special election. Um, if you're a charter government, can you write into your charter of when and when you, when you can and when you cannot have special elections, putting referendum on the ballot? Do they have to be at specified election time or can they be midterm, off year elections that get very costly? We know that very well. So can that be spelled out if you're a charter of when you can and cannot have special elections. That's one question. Um, I hear a lot of the citizens, mostly from the islands in the Northwest, regarding this um, 
the home rule and vacation rentals and they're very concerned about that it's been on it's been off and how different or similar would that be if the legislature so chose to take it upon themselves to say there's no regulation in heights of buildings they can just say all bets are off you can have whatever height you want um, to me that that sounds similar to what they're doing with these vacation rentals and um, those were the two main questions that I had right now thank you Madam Chair. Look, could I have that? her answer yeah. the question yeah. that and then we'll go to you Madam Chairman, on the issue of having local control over calling special elections, um, the answer to that question is going to be dictated by state law, depending on um, what the purpose of the special election is. And this is one of those areas where I'd love to tell you, I absolutely positively know the answer off the top of my head, but I don't. Um, so it's, it's going to be driven by state law. There are constraints. Um, on certain topics of when those special elections could actually be held. So that's, it's gonna be a state law driven issue. Um, the opportunity for uh, doing anything different than that may exist, but I would recommend a specific analysis on that issue, um, depending on the topic for the special election. Are there restraints on special elections in non-charter counties? Again, it depends on the topic, yes. And in fact, um, I mean, what comes to mind is a piece of legislation that did not pass this legislative session but has been around um, for a couple of years and it relates to um, local option sales tax questions and where those could be placed. And you all are probably familiar that the legislative initiative was that those questions um, could not be placed on the ballot at a special election, that it had to go on a general election ballot. So had that passed, then no charter could um, alter that at the local level. And that's why I say it's gonna be driven by state law on, on a subject matter basis. Um, any differences in that uh, state law um, regarding uh, counties and school boards about special elections and so forth? I'm not sure what you're asking um, with respect to the school boards. The school boards have special language in the legislature of when and when they can't have special elections. I don't know the answer. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, and then on vacation rentals, um, could the state legislature, I believe, Commissioner, this was your question, um, pass a bill that basically eliminated the ability at the local level to regulate the heights of buildings at all? Uh, I mean, I, I think the answer is probably, unfortunately, yes. But um, that doesn't mean that it couldn't be subject to challenge. But in the first instance, the answer would be yes. OK. Thank you. Commissioner Smith. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Jenny, could you talk more so the resident understand when you talk about 20 uh, charter governments, some of these charters empowered mayors, uh, Orange County, Miami-Dade County, and even for the standpoint of Leon, they just got rid of partisan races, but I don't even believe it's term limits there. But could you talk in more detail? Because when we talk about population, those are large populations, but they empowered and gave more power. Could you deliberate that with the Sure. Um, there, are, there are some of those 20 counties, yes, that created this mayor form of government, if you will, and created them as a strong mayor. And so we have three in the state, um, and only charter counties can choose that option. So no charter county can have an elected executive form of government. So yes, in terms of executing county policy, so really driving the administrative functions of how directives are carried out in those three counties, it is an elected position that is then subject to the will of the electorate. And if the electorate doesn't like how the policies are carried out, then the mayor or the elected chairman obviously can get unelected. Um, so that's certainly that we see that play out in Orange, Jacksonville, Duval, and in Miami-Dade. And the, the elected mayor operates more as a CEO. Yes. So I don't want them to confuse that it's more simplified. More power is put into the hand of one 
uh, with executive authority Correct. with deputies working under that. So when you talk about population shift, I just want to get that clarified from, from that standpoint. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Um, I think this has been a very informative meeting. Um, I really appreciate the county attorney's work to put it together. And certainly, uh, Ms. Delegal, for being here and informing us. And uh, any closing comments, uh, Mr. Palmer? Just, just a little bit of further commentary, uh, getting back to Mr. Goff's question of, you know, give me five pros and give me five cons. That's impossible to do, frankly. Let's take the simple concept of term limits, yeah. okay? <laughs> Folks are wildly, uh, have wildly varying opinions on the appropriateness of term limits. So it depends on who you talk to. Let's talk about single member districts versus at large commissioners. There are wildly varying opinions. So is it pro or con? Some people will say pro, some people will say con. So it's a virtually impossible question to answer. Um, so, you know, again, wildly varying opinions. I would just like to express my sincere gratitude to Ginger for visiting with us this evening. Um, I just want to know, how can you live in Leon County and not be a Florida State Seminole fan? <laughs> <laughs> That's my only question for her. But in any event, I just, uh, I really want to thank Ginger for coming and, and, and sharing her expertise. She is an expert on, on this and many other subjects when it comes to local government law, and I would like to give her a round of applause. Yeah. And thank you to the public who all came out and sat through this. I will tell you, your Board of County Commissioners is going on 12 hours of straight meetings yeah. at this time. So I say with great gusto, we are adjourned. <laughs>